Uh, we are presenting today on a uh, COVID policy reset on coming together and centering equity guidance for federal, state, and local policymakers, but also guidance for you. You can be a leader in your own community, and we will discuss that today. We have several speakers who've come together uh, from all across the country because and across the world because we care about doing better. Uh, and the speakers to, uh, who will speak today represent only themselves. They do not represent their organizations. They also don't represent one another. They only represent people here. We're here because we care. We care about the children, uh, an estimated 170,000 children who've lost their parents to COVID in the United States. We care about our healthcare workers who are taking on the burden of caring for patients and losing patients. We, we care about our essential workers, like these teachers and school staff who lost their lives to COVID, like first responders, uh, grocery and food workers, cleaning staff, people who lost their, their lives due to COVID in all kinds of professions. We care about you. We also care about people who are frustrated by school closures and business closures. We care about parents who don't want their kids to wear masks. We know that we can better control COVID to better serve everyone. And so to, that's the presentation I will give today, how controlling COVID creates a virtuous cycle that benefits health, the economy, and our lives. I do not have any conflicts of interest except for my research funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I don't receive any money uh, to support masks or any other specific intervention. To summarize what I'll present today, we have an ongoing Delta surge. There's an Omicron surge on the horizon and even already beginning to happen. We have the tools to reduce the spread and the harms of the virus. We need strong leadership on policies to help us use our tools well and control the virus to benefit our health, lives, economy, and society. To summarize where we are in the, in the current situation, Delta has killed 195,000 people who have died pre largely preventable deaths with vaccines and other tools available to reduce their deaths. It has killed people under the age of 55 at a record rate. Omicron is in the United States, it's highly transmissible and it's of unknown severity, but, but the high transmissibility alone is a concern. And 39% of people in the United States are not fully vaccinated and are highly vulnerable to severe outcomes. The United States is an outlier in that we had eight times more deaths from Delta relative to other high income countries during our surge. And we may be so again with Omicron unless we take more actions to address it. It's important to recognize that structural factors shape who is vaccinated and unvaccinated in the United States. We have not seen our essential workers who are most exposed to COVID be able to get vaccinated at the same rate as people who are higher income. We see a continued gradient where the lowest income people are least likely to be vaccinated, even though many report that they would want or consider a vaccine. There are also marked disparities by race and ethnicity. We see here that, that cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are all especially higher for Native American, Alaskan, Indian, uh, and Alaska Native people, uh, for Black people, and for Hispanic people, relative to white and Asian people. There are continued disparities by income in who is getting COVID right now. We don't have data on who has COVID by income, but the Census Pulse contains data on who reports missing work in the past week due to COVID-19. And what's most striking about this graph is not actually the red-blue comparison, but the, but the comparison of what's happening to people who earn the lowest amount relative to people who earn the highest amount, regardless of whether they are vaccinated. People who are vaccinated are much better protected with blue relative to red, but we also see that we have continued higher rates of COVID among the lowest income people relative to the highest income. And this means that we can do more to protect these populations in a targeted way. What we know is that vaccines reduce severe outcomes well, but, and, but protection against infection wanes. We have more to learn about the severity of breakthrough infections, including long COVID. And the first step to learning more is having the data. 
Reinfection is common at the individual and the population levels, and we have more to learn about the severity. It's possible that we obtain immunity uh, that, that helps reduce severity with reinfection, or it's also possible that, um, that repeated infection hurt, harms people's organs if they have damage the first time. We need to learn more by collecting the data. COVID spreads in all crowded indoor settings, including schools. If you have heard that COVID does not spread in schools or in grocery stores in any other setting, that is misinformation. COVID spreads in shared air in indoor settings. And that means schools as well as workplaces and grocery stores and any crowded space. Mask policies reduce the amount of COVID in shared air. And ventilation standards reduce the amount of COVID in shared air. Testing allows for prompt treatment and quarantine. When we think about policies, we should think about them as trade-offs. Policies bring our tools to scale and they make them equitable. They ensure that everybody is using them. So when we have policies like vaccine mandates and, vaccine and mask policies, they're actually the opposite of lockdowns and school closures. They're choosing to use those policies to reduce spread instead of choosing to use the much more onerous policies to reduce spread instead of choosing to do nothing to reduce spread and taking a toll on all of us and our lives and the economy. So here, vaccine mandates and delivery ensure that as many people as possible are covered. Indoor mask policies for crowded indoor settings reduce the spread, especially when 39% of people are unvaccinated, but also when everyone may be more at risk and may not have had a chance to get boosted yet uh, when a new variant is arriving. Workplace safety standards and paid sick leave help ensure that those lowest income workers are protected, as do ventilation standards that are enforced and capacity limits. Indoor mask policies only for schools don't make as much sense as masking for everybody, because the goal is to reduce transmission. Schools are a high transmission setting. It is the uh, school aged children currently have the most cases of any age group in the United States that reflect that, that COVID spreads efficiently in schools. Uh, but we can all mask together rather than only ask children, asking children to mask. Uh, indoor dining closures are also effective, but they're more onerous. So these are the policies that we don't want to have to resort to the broad business closure, the stay at home orders, this, uh, and the um, the school closures, uh, but they but preventing COVID and helping parents, especially, make it through the next couple of months while we have a huge surge, can help kids grow up with their parents forever, or, or avoid having kids lose their parents forever, um, and and allow them to likely grow up with their parents. Um, if we have no control, we have the circumstance that or little control, we have the circumstance that we have now, which is unpleasant for everybody. Um, vaccine mandates and delivery and mask policies for all reduce transmission in everyone for vaccinated and unvaccinated people and avoid worse harms like school closures. Just to go into further detail on mask policies, some of our other panelists will go into more detail on um, rapid testing and on um, uh, other policies to mitigate COVID. But just to go into more detail on um, masks and crowded indoor settings. The idea of mask policies is that they act to clear the air of COVID in a way that no individual can do on their own. Um, they help reduce the amount of COVID that someone who unknowingly has it breathes into the air, and they help make sure that even if there is some COVID that goes into the air, that the other people are wearing masks. Um, so it's only something we can accomplish through collective action. And we do see in two strong policy analyses that uh, mass policies begin reducing transmission immediately, and that over time the effect grows because each case averted uh, averts further transmission to other people. Most people want mass policies. 72% of people in the morning consult poll in December 2021, and 64% of the people in the Ipsos poll in December 2021 said that they want mass policies. Many headlines reflect the influence of misinformation, which is a concerted campaign by just a few people who do, some of whom do have funding from specific right-wing extremists um, to put out misinformation. Um, so it's misinformation that, um, that COVID doesn't spread in any crowded indoor setting. It's misinformation that masks don't work or that vaccines don't work. Both work, we need them. 
And it's better for all of us if we control COVID. I also want, want to say that it's a remarkable testament to how much we care about each other, that despite all of these headlines, most people want to take care of themselves and each other with mass policies. So from a government standpoint, um, what would be ideal to see at the federal, state, and local level is to see implementation of several measures to address the, the COVID surge and the Omicron surge that will be happening. Um, I, uh, you know, I think only the federal government has the, the funding and the resources available to do the most. We see from following our work, from our work following state policies, that federal guidance has a very big impact. So the federal government has the most potential for impact, but everybody has potential for enormous impact in an emergency context like we faced with the Omicron surge and the ongoing Delta surge. Uh, federal guidance supporting mask mandates would be particularly important. State and local indoor mask mandates make a big difference. They reach millions of people or thousands of people everywhere that they're implemented. Um, and if you want an off switch, you can make mask policies data driven so they turn off when transmission goes back down. Walk-in vaccine clinics. Uh, the federal government could waive the need for people to fill out the online forms at pharmacies. Uh, even in our hardest hit communities here in Massachusetts, you can't walk in and get a vaccine. You have to make an appointment online and you have to fill out the forms. And that can be a huge impediment to people who are lower income, who are busy, um, and who may not have um, easy access to internet or internet or English literacy. Mass communications about vaccine clinics and vaccine safety in, in social media and with community groups in several languages to make it accessible to everybody. And free N95s and rapid tests um, especially for people in crowded indoor settings. And I will say that all of this is aligned with Biden's January 2021 COVID plan, and we have not implemented it yet, but we should. Um, while we're waiting for the federal government to implement those aspects of the plan, state governments and local governments should act. It is a good idea for you, for your people, for your businesses, for equity. It is a good idea to act on mass policies. When leaders are leading, everyone can help. So even um, people who are not involved in government, you can make a big difference in your community, can share the facts as widely as possible in several languages. The first principle of crisis communications from the CDC is to be first, because you want to fill, um, uh, you want to fill the air with um, information about how to prevent COVID rather than information about COVID, or sorry, rather than with COVID itself or with, um, with misinformation. So, be first, get the information out there, let people know there's a surge, let people know what to do about it. If you're an employer, you can provide free N95 masks and rapid tests that work, and people can post vaccine clinic flyers in several languages in their own communities. We would love to do more to work together to help. So use your voice, use it with your communities. My students have used it with their communities. They share with their friends and their, their communities back home the, the importance of getting vaccinated. You can do the same. And we also hope to organize ourselves to come together to do better. So sign up here to help to coordinate our actions, to put out the facts and, and to come together to, to protect one another because we all care. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sojourner who will talk about the um, controlling COVID and supporting the labor market. Thanks. Julia, um, yeah, I'm Aaron Sojourner. I'm a labor economist at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I wanna talk about relationship between public health and the labor market uh, briefly. Um, there's really no, there's not a trade-off here in the big picture. Um, you know, there might be trade-offs in the very short run, but what we see is that more public health uh, promotes a healthier labor market and a healthier economy. So if you look across um, time over time, uh, a simple way to look at it is in months where COVID, when jobs are growing, those are the months when uh, COVID cases are falling. And in months when uh, jobs are falling, that's, those are the months when COVID cases are rising. This shouldn't surprise you, um, but, and you can look at a lot of different ways, but um, you know, the virus makes people sick and makes the economy sick. 
Um, I'll just hit again this slide that uh, Julia showed. Um, you know, we can see that even among people from similar similar places in the economy, um, you can see that people who are not vaccinated are missing work uh, more, many times more often in a week uh, than people who are vaccinated. Um, and you can see this across, especially as hitting uh, lower income Americans. And, um, you know, these are big percentages, five, six, seven, eight percent uh, of people are missing work uh, weekly due to either taking care of themselves because they're sick with COVID symptoms or taking care of people, uh, other people in their families and loved ones who are sick with COVID symptoms. Um, and vaccination makes a big difference in keeping people healthy and able to you know, support their families and, um, and, and earn in the labor market. Another uh, piece of information I wanna show you is, this looks at the working age Americans from 18 to 64, and it looks over time from the beginning of the year until now uh, at people's vaccination status. What you can see is that um, you know, about one third of people are not yet fully vaccinated. About one third of people were vaccinated more than six months ago in blue, um, and they haven't gotten a booster yet. About one third of people were either vaccinated in the last six months in gray or longer ago, but now they've gotten a booster in black. So what you can see is that, uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress on getting people fully vaccinated, but uh, we really need to promote uh, boosters for their health protective benefits and benefits in, in reducing spread. Um, and there's a lot of work to do there. It looks like just in the last few weeks, uh, we kind of stopped the, the fall and we're kind of holding level now as boosters get more and more adopted, but we have still a lot of work to do. Only about a third of working age Americans are in compliance uh, with CDC recommendations. Um, and look, you know, increasing public health means we can increase supply of labor and, and goods and services in the economy. We can fight inflation by improving people's options. Uh, lack of public health sickens the economy and you know, pushes the Fed to cut demand and cut consumption and make people worse off economically. Um, and we're you know, seeing that today, uh, I bet. Another big open question is the effect of long COVID and suppressing labor supply. Uh, you know, from the medical literature, it's clear that this could be a really big issue. Uh, but from the labor market data side, we really can't see this. It's just not something that's measured well and we need better data. So I'll stop there, thank you. Hi, I think I'm next. Um, I'm Sabrina Sumu from Boston Medical Center, Boston University of Pseudomedicine. I'm gonna share my slides and I'm gonna talk about the role of health centers. Um, so let's see, make this, I have no conflicts. All right. Um, so before we get started, I get started, I wanted to sort of briefly to make sure that we're all on the same page, talk about the role of community health centers in our COVID-19 efforts. And as you know, equity has been identified as a key priority in the national COVID-19 response strategy. And um, to this end, COVID-19 vaccines um, have been dis distributed through community health centers. And just to put every, to, so that we're all on the same page. So community health centers are um, often the primary source of care for low income populations and people of color. There are approximately 1400 um, health center organizations in the US and they serve approximately 30 million patients in, in 2019. So a, a really large source of, of care. Um, and, and community health centers are trusted source of health information in the community. So I was very glad to see that the federal government is actually using community health centers as a way to get uh, populations vaccinated. 
Okay, so next, so just some highlights in, in terms of just to show the impact of, of community health centers. So the majority of individuals who've been vaccinated at uh, community health centers were people of color. And as you can see here, this is actually a graph that we often don't see when we look at healthcare distribution and patients who are getting vaccinated. As you can see here in this pie chart, um, people of color make up 64% of patients uh, 64% of, 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 of patients who were vaccinated at a community health center identify as people of color. So, and as you can see here, a huge proportion of Latinos are being vaccinated in community health centers. And this is, uh, so that was data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And again, here data from, from Kaiser Family Foundation, which shows that people of color uh, made up increasing proportions of COVID-19 vaccinations at community health center. Again, this is data to show that um, community health centers have, have a major role to play um, in order to reach uh, equity goals. So just to orient you on this graph, on the x-axis, we have time. So this is from January to May. Unfortunately, we don't have access yet to more recent data. And then on the y-axis, we have percentages, just to orient you in terms of colors. Uh, the gray represent um, individuals who identify as white, the light blue individuals who identify as black, and then we have here Latinos, and then Asians for the other light blue, and then indigenous individuals who are just on indigenous, um, and then others with more than one race. As, as you can see, just looking through here, that people of color have been making up uh, a higher proportions of individuals who are vaccinated at health care centers. So again, just to reinforce that health centers have an important role to play. And so in terms of suggested actions for federal, state, and local governments, so number one, it's going to be very important to collect data on race and ethnicity as it was presented in prior um, prior presentations already in, in this, in this uh, webinar, we really need data on race and ethnicity. And actually, health centers have actually done a pretty good job, even when you compare it to the federal level or even CDC data to, uh, with collecting race and ethnicity. So we're going to know, have to know how we're doing so that we can better um, adapt our approach. One important thing that's going to be really critical is to have partnerships with health care centers and, and other organizations to improve access to vaccinations within the community. And um, so the, the reason why actually I was selected to talk a little bit more about this is because um, the hospital system where I work for, Boston Medical Center, worked in partnership with, uh, for example, the Mattapan uh, health, Community Health Center for vaccination sites at actually local churches. So going to to, to uh, places of worship was sort of a way to connect with the community. And instead of expecting uh, people to come to the medical center to get vaccinated, we were actually going to the community and using a trusted leader, so community health center um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a trusted source to vaccinate. Um, and then also using that partnership between community health centers for mobile vaccination events, including at schools, at grocery stores, at community centers. So again, using the reputation of the health centers as a trusted uh, source. So this, I just included here um, a figure just to show you the impact of that partnership between health centers and, and, and medical centers. So Boston Medical Health System, System is a chosen example of a collaboration between a community health center to improve access. So in this figure um, here, we're showing the racial ethnic breakdown of people who are vaccinated in the whole state of Massachusetts and comparing it to um, to, to people who were vaccinated at any sites within the Boston Medical Center. So not just the, the health centers, but other sites that we had. But this is to show you that by going to the community and part and having your general approach, including working with the health centers, we can really um, have an impact. And so with, with our sites, we're vaccinated about four and a half times uh, the proportion that we were seeing at the state level for people who identify as Black or African Americans, and at about 1.4 times for uh, individuals who identify as Latinos. So in terms of additional, so, you know, partnership with community health centers and organizations in the community to have conversations to address misinformation about vaccines. As we know right now, you know, we're at a point where 
there is more access to vaccines, but there is still, we still need to work on, on, on vaccine acceptance. And the way to do it is to actually go to the community and have multilingual conversations and also have an opportunity for people to ask questions outside of the clinical settings so that it doesn't feel um, either, you know, not accessible. And then another important point, which Boston Medical Center actually did a good job with is recruiting a workforce and retaining our workforce and advancing our workforce that's made up of individuals who look like the community that you serve. And I think that that was actually one of the key and success of all the programs that Boston Medical Center implemented was because when we were going to those mobile sites, when we were in those community clinics, we actually were there with the workforce, with nurses, with other health professionals who actually look like the community that we were serving and, and that was able to answer questions um, and be very approachable. So on that end, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oops, that was not what I want to share. But anyway, so um, I think um, I'm not sure who's after me, but I'll let that person introduce themselves. Thanks. This is Chris Alonso. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the importance of grassroots outreach um, for COVID response. I work as the health equity director at La Colaborativa, which is a mostly Latino women run organization in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And just to situate you, many of you might already know that Chelsea was one of the hardest hit communities uh, by COVID in March, 2020. It had a six times higher rate of COVID than the rest of Massachusetts. And Chelsea is you know, your, your typical example of communities that we're talking about today. It's 67% Latino, mostly essential workers. And from the data, we could see that most of the people that were getting COVID in Chelsea were people who were essential workers in their thirties and forties. Um, by December, 2020 in, in research that I did, 44% of the community had lost their job, 33% had underlying health problems, 10% didn't have health insurance, but really the economic impact of COVID was severe to the point where 83% of the community of Chelsea was relying on the food pantries for help. And you can see here, this is the um, La Colaborativa pivoted from being an organization that supported um, immigration and workers' rights to really um, having a food pantry, which, which is central to the work that we do. So what we did was we designed an outreach project, which is based out of 10 health promoters. They're all women, they're all from Chelsea. And it was really street, it was street work, street canvassing, door knocking. And as Julia mentioned earlier, one of the biggest hurdles once um, vaccines became accessible in Chelsea was the issue of appointments. Asking people to make a phone call when they have a 15 minute break on their shift or asking people to go online in a very complicated, um, we're collecting data about your situation when some people are undocumented and are afraid of that was, was really absolutely not relevant to the community of Chelsea. So what we did was we designed a grassroots community um, vaccine appointment system where the health workers were going door to door, hanging out on the streets and giving people direct vaccine appointments. And this has continued until now to make sure that people are able to access the vaccine at the time that they are, um, that they are available. So in Chelsea, we've always pushed for making sure that we have vaccines in the evening after 5 p.m. and on weekends, which is when essential workers are most available to get vaccines. The other huge strategy that we've done is social media and using social media, not referring people to the CDC website, which is heavy and it's loaded and it's complicated, but really making the messaging accessible to the community that we serve. So we do Facebook Lives constantly where we have community influencers talking about issues, interviews, fun things. We, you know, we film the vaccine fairs and the health fairs that we do. And we also have a TikTok channel because we found that the greatest gap in, um, or sort of the, in, in vaccine outreach is people from 20 to 29 years old. And they are on TikTok. They're not actually on Facebook anymore. So we have a very active TikTok channel that um, targets this cohort of people. And really what we've learned is that if we're on the streets talking to people, we can make over 900 vaccine appointments a month. Um, we've had really successful fairs where we vaccinate 120 youth in one afternoon. We have music, we have games, we have pizza. We have things that are relevant to the youth. And um, really the, the sort of the secret sauce to La Colaborativa is that we connect with people and we address their concerns. 
And we take these concerns and we use them to advocate for the protection of the needs of the people of Chelsea. So really, if, you know, I think everybody here is going to talk about, you know, the larger social determinants of health. And we, we know we need to talk about air quality and housing and working and, and, you know, all of these issues that are part of the system that, that, that existed that made COVID such a devastating virus in our communities. But I really want to talk about what we need to do on the ground. And this means that with the rapid tests and the mass mandates and the vaccine mandates and the access to vaccines, I really want to hone in on strengthening local public health. Please excuse my daughter in the background who's, who's also participating. Um, still at the Chelsea Department of Public Health, there are two staff. And this is critical. We have uh, you know, a city that was so devastated by COVID that still has two staff means that the city of Chelsea relies on community-based organizations to do a lot of the street work. As community organizations, we rely on donations from donors and from individuals, and we rely on in-kind donations such as the masks, the hand sanitizer, the training, um, the you know all of the infrastructure that makes it so that our health promoters can do the work and access the people. So really, if you know the the piece that I want to add in is that we really need to strengthen the community organizations because they know what's going on on the ground, but also listen to the community organizations so that we're always integrating what is relevant and meaningful to the people that are most getting COVID. So thank you very much. And here's my contact information. And I'll stop sharing and over to the next person. Hi, thank you. And thank you, Christina. We actually are old classmates. So it's so nice to see you here today. Um, I will share my screen. Oh, my apologies. It looks like I have two screens up. Um, so starting quickly, my name is Kiona Wynn, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about COVID-19 vaccination, considering racial and social inequities, and actually as like a good um, transition from a bit of what Christina was talking about, considering um, reaching youth populations. So I actually coordinated what was known as Boston Vaccine Day. It was a festival, a vaccination festival that occurred here in Boston, at, in Roxbury at Malcolm X Park. And what we really tried to do was engage younger crowds, specifically teenagers and young adults between that age of 20 to 29, 20 to 35 of a message around vaccination as a way to be empowered and in control of your health, specifically trying to connect it to cultural messages within the Black community around joy and positivity um, and community um, and vaccination as a tool to get that back. One thing that we did really well was that we were able to operationalize a word of mouth um, platform or way to spread the message. So we know that word of mouth is really one of the ways that you are going to effectuate a behavior change or, or encourage people to get vaccinated if they're hesitant. So what we worked to do was use TikTok. This is a TikTok video and other platforms as a way to get young people to spread the word to other young people about the importance of vaccination. Here's some images from the event. So as you can see, it's completely fun and lively. And there's a ton of young people excited to be there. Um, and that kind of brings me to the, the problem as described was there are historic and contemporary um, anti-bacterial anti-Black racial politics, ideologies, and cultures that have created these unique barriers when we think about vaccination within the Black community. And they can be broadly defined as barriers to access, mistrust in the medical system, underinsurance and economic concerns, and marginalization to low-paying jobs. So what the solutions that I'm going to reaffirm that I saw during Boston Vaccine Day on the ground that I saw really worked, and that's what I really want to focus on, is what I saw work on on the ground doing the work of Boston Vaccine Day was uh, to emphasize in marketing and health communications that the COVID-19 vaccination is free of charge um, and even to consider the um, considerations of how people might think of vaccination on their immigration status and to really emphasize that this is free of charge. Um, I thought that we found that to be critically important. 
The next was encourage standing vaccination sites um, at, at trusted and convenient places. And um, some of the speakers have already hit on this in their work, but those trusted places such as Morningstar Baptist Church, which was mentioned and other places are really important in having those standing vaccination sites where you know that you can come in and you can get a vaccine at this place where you might already go for worship and or fun. Um, it really helps to um, um, broker a trusting connection. Um, fun mobile or pop-up clinics. This is what Boston Vaccine Day was. It was a pop-up, a very large pop-up clinic um, in disproportionately affected neighborhoods with entities that have strong connections to the community. Again, this was mentioned, making sure that the workers reflect the, the people who live in the area, but then even thinking about organizing and who's organizing the event. If you can, if possible, have a community worker or someone from the community at the very highest levels of organization for these pop-up clinics, you'll find that they have so much in-group knowledge about what works, what streets to target, what type of um, delivery mechanisms or outreach mechanisms could really be powerful in this community. And wrapping up quickly, finally, invest in vaccination sites that accommodate working schedules. Um, and here, I think one of the biggest things that came out to me was thinking about the importance of people who might be working double shifts um, or multiple shifts and the experience of that. So if you only have one day off um, a week and with that one day, do you really want to spend it sitting inside of a CVS? Um, getting your COVID-19 vaccination. More, more than likely, most people answer no to that question, which um, we want them to be answering yes. So how can we create that fun experience where this is something that you want to go to and you, you feel comfortable using your spare time to better serve, the, um, to get vaccinated so that we can move out of this pandemic. Um, so that is the end of my time and I will turn it over to the next speaker. Um, yeah, I saw a message. I'm happy to share the, the next one. And yes, I do think it is Teresa who's after me. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. And I am apologizing for the Teresa, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, Teresa, actually, maybe better if you turn off your video so we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Is this better? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. See you see the slides. Great. So um, I'm going to talk about just the three tiered nature of our governmental public health system. And um, I am uh, excited to have worked in all three levels of governmental public health. And so one of the things that has been really important to our three tiered system is to ensure that there is redundancy at each level. So there's the federal level, the state level and local level public health. And the goals of all three levels are to assure the public's health, assess health conditions and concerns, and to develop public health policies. And it is important that all three levels have these same goals because if any one level of our public health infrastructure were to fail, we don't want all of public health to fail. And so in the event that, let's say the federal level is not able to do its job, we still have the, um, ability to assess the public's health um, at the local and state level. But when you have three levels that have the same goal, the question is always gonna be who's on first? Who's supposed to take charge in the event of emergency? Who's supposed to take charge in the event of a crisis? Who's supposed to take charge over the population's health um, just in normal times? But the constitution has been really clear on this and set it out that uh, the health of the population is largely the function of state and local governments. The federal government totally has a role here and their role is to work at the national level to assess the nation's health, to come up with 
recommendations or health priorities, set national standards, um, but and also really work to support the work that is being done at the state and local level. And that is uh, how we really, how local health departments work with the federal government. Uh, but it's clear that when it comes down to the, ensuring the health, making sure that those policies are in place, those protections are in place for the population's health, that belongs to your state and local health departments. Um, so when we are coming to concerns about um, the way that we work across all three of these uh, levels in governmental public health and making sure that there is smooth connections across all of them, uh, we are really relying at the state and local level. We're relying on the federal government to really set the national agenda, to set the tone, to give us that um, resources, uh, their um, time, their expertise, their funding, in order to really implement those policies that are needed at the local level. We are looking to them to set the tone, but the implementation happens at the state and local level. Um, I think one of the quotes that I really look back on a lot to help know where we're supposed to go from here is that the success or failure of any government in a final analysis is with the well-being of its citizens. Nothing is more important to the state than its public health. The state's paramount concern must be the health of its people. And that's really where we need to focus. When we're dealing with the pandemic and trying to figure out uh, what is what we need to focus on? Should it be the economy? Should it be health? It's really laid out. Uh, FDR says it nicely here. And even um, the, the roles and the powers that public health has and is given to us in the Constitution makes it clear that the health of the people is where we really need to focus and that we need to do that at the state and local level with the support and expertise of those in the federal government. And thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ann Sasson and I'm going to bring a rural health equity lens to the conversation today. I'm from Dartmouth College and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. We've heard a lot about rural health um, this week in the news and I wanna start by saying that, um, that we need to think about how do we disrupt a dual narrative that dominates the media headlines that rurality is protective and rural institutions are fragile. Um, we, during the course of the pandemic, have seen persistent rural disparities in cases, deaths, and now vaccinations. At the same time, in our own research in Northern New England, we've documented significant strengths in the pandemic response of rural institutions and communities. Um, we know that disparaging accounts of rural America abound. However, in our own work, we've observed a rural ethos, a constellation of pragmatism, compassion, and solidarity manifest in the response of rural crises, um, including the pandemic. And if we're going to advance rural health equity, we need to target both the drivers of these disparities, but also change rural narratives. Um, we see these disparities in rural northern New England as well. Vermont, um, where I'm located, led the U.S. in its early COVID response and is currently the most vaccinated state in the United States. Neighboring New Hampshire is also among the most vaccinated states. But these top-line in vaccination indicators mask significant rural disparities in vaccination, health, the underlying determinants of health, as well as in barriers in access to health care. Vermont leads the US right now in vaccination among children five to 11 years of age and has achieved 49% vaccination overall, yet this also conceals significant disparities. The more metropolitan Chittenden County boasts a vaccination rate of 64%, twice that of the three counties that comprise the rural Northeastern Kingdom. And this overlay of low vaccination rates, populations that are at higher risk of COVID-19, and social disparities created the conditions for the current crisis facing the region. I want to provide a, a small snapshot of the current crisis that we are facing in rural northern New England. 
A year ago, Vermont managed COVID with strong policies. This year, in absence of strong policies, COVID is managing the health, education, and economy of both rural Vermont and rural New Hampshire. New Hampshire currently has the highest rate of COVID-19 cases in the US and Vermont is among the top 10. This crisis has pushed our rural health systems to the brink and disrupted our schools. And I wanna note that our schools were among the first in the country to open and many have experienced widespread disruption and been forced to close this fall. Drawing on our experience here, I'd like to briefly highlight five policy priorities for rural health equity as part of the conversation today. First, it's, it's a critical to accelerate the delivery of vaccines and boosters to our rural communities. Policymakers must invest resources in overcoming access barriers as well as the sources of rural of hesitancy in our rural regions. Second, state policymakers must enact clear state policies, including mask mandates, and support our local leaders to implement them. Third, our critical access hospitals and rural health systems are at breaking point and urgently need greater support to respond to the surge that we're experiencing. Fourth, policymakers must actively tar target barriers to testing, treatment, and healthcare, including non-COVID care. Finally, we must rehumanize the rural narrative. Narratives that denigrate rural communities or discount their willingness to engage in public health measures lead to a reduction in empathy and erode the political will to enact mitigation measures. I want to conclude today by saying that our Northern New England region has shown that poor outcomes are not inevitable. They are a policy choice. And today I want to, I'm asking, I'm joining others in saying that we need to make policy choices that protect the health, education and economies of our rural communities. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Cecilia Tamarine. I'm going to talk about an overlooked group of people, um, people who have been systematically actually ignored throughout the entire pandemic um, and calls to some actions, urgent actions that we need to support pregnant um, and postpartum women and people as well as their infants during the pandemic in this new phase. Okay, so the first point that I need to make is how much of a gap we face for this particular population. So the best data that we have, which is of course fragmented and problematic in the first place, shows us that really only about a third of people who are pregnant are currently vaccinated. We have despite some increased efforts and expansion of messaging, we have really just plateaued and uh, we're not making much progress at all. This is from CDC data. Um, and of course, again, one of the major issues is that we don't quite have all the data that we would like, but um, you can see that the gaps are enormous. The second important point to make is that even within that dismal third of the people who are vaccinated currently, we have enormous inequities. This is of course not a surprise if you've been following this talk or if you've been following the pandemic, we're mapping that once again, the um, green line on the bottom is uh, black pregnant people who are lagging behind um, in vaccination rates. And you can see that the other groups are sort of clustering in the middle. Um, they include Hispanic and white uh, pregnant people. And then we've got uh, actually Asian pregnant people who are doing the best in vaccination efforts. Again, important to note that these um, inequities are reflecting both historic and contemporary ongoing structural racism and barriers at every possible level to accessing vaccinations. The worst possible end of the outcome spectrum, of course, is deaths. And this graph 
every time I look at it, it um, it's just is incredibly upsetting. We're seeing sort of the tip of the iceberg of the terrible situation that has come out of this neglect of this group, um, all the way from the beginning of not being able to include these people in clinical trials, having the delay in getting outcome data to the inadequacies in outreach, the amount of misinformation targeting this group. But I wanna showcase the fact that not only are these deaths horrific in and of themselves, but the actual impacts are multiplying and compounded. So we have severe illness during pregnancy. We have pregnancy complications. We have, of course, the terrible deaths that I mentioned. And I just wanna draw attention to some of the horrible stories that we have been hearing from providers at the front lines who are taking care of people who are using some of the same kinds of strategies that they have used you know, in other kinds of um, terrible end of life situations and also around infant loss, like making molds of um, hands of, uh, of a mother who is dying so that their children can remember them. I mean, these are just absolutely horrific. Um, we have on another end of this, an increase in stillbirths, an increase in preterm births, all with, of course, lifelong consequences. We have children who are orphaned. We have entire families and of course, communities affected by these losses. And throughout this, imagine all of those inequities that we heard multiplying, they're compounded in this group of population that we're talking about. Turning to a somewhat more hopeful uh, vision, on the other hand, while losses are multiplied, we also have protection that we can multiply. So vaccination protects pregnant people and passes protection to their fetus. So that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Vaccination also protects not only lactating people and women, but also passes that protection through breast milk. We don't know quite how much, but nevertheless, it is the only opportunity that infants have um, because infants, of course, are not yet eligible for vaccination. So again, this protection is multiplying. Any measures that we implement are protecting multiple people here. So it is it truly a, both the effects that are terrible, but also the possibilities for benefits are enormous. I just wanna close on the actions that I would love to, um, share and that I hope that you get out to your networks. We really, really need to implement a multi-layered, equity-centered, comprehensive public health response that protects people in this particular presentation, but as well as everyone who is vulnerable. They depend on these multiple layers of protection. We need to tackle misinformation at the source because this population in particular is being targeted by misinformation at an exponential rate. We would need to really enhance our messaging to health departments, to professional societies and healthcare providers who are caring for these groups, pregnant people, people who are planning on becoming pregnant, lactating people, postpartum people, about the enhanced risk that they're at for COVID and the protection measures that we can take. We also need coordinated media campaigns as well as community-based and, commu and point of care uh, messaging so that we can enhance the outreach to this group of people across the entire childbearing spectrum from planning a pregnancy through postpartum. We really are in a race against time, especially in the face of additional potential surges that we're looking at right now. Please share this with your networks. And if you have any questions, get in touch. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Minna. I'm a Chief Science Officer at EMED. And uh, this is a, a digital healthcare company. I was just recently a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, where I was an epidemiologist, immunologist, and physician, and I'm, uh, have now departed from there. So disclosures, I am the Chief Medical Officer of this uh, digital healthcare company. I'm on the Medical Advisory Board of a catalyzer company that makes 
uh, inexpensive portable devices for health and public health. And I'm on the board of directors of a company that, protein, that sequences uh, proteins. So testing in a pandemic is, is what I want to talk about. This is one of the most crucial public health tools um, in, uh, that we have uh, at our disposal. It's not just a medical tool. Testing in this pandemic is a crucial public health tool. Um, I've, I've, this is a paper I wrote last year with Christian Anderson around what are the different uses of testing? And I urge people to take a look at it if you're wondering, but you can have testing for medicine, but you also can have testing for public health. You can have things to test to know so that you don't infect people that are just around you in your orbit. You can have tests to enter into a location, tests to stay uh, uh, in order to stay in school, go to work, tests to go and travel. These are all public health uses of a test, not medical uh, uses. And then there's, there are medical uses where you need uh, treatment. And all of these that I've listed require tests to be fast. And this is something unfortunate the US has done quite poorly thus far and not in any way in, in an equitable uh, fashion. Uh, so it's been a long road, but finally efforts in the US have been uh, beginning to pay off. The US has been very slow to recognize testing in this pandemic. We're starting to see some states provide free testing to the public in uh, multiple different ways. We had the White House pushing for coverage by health insurance companies, which is a very um, uh, contentious issue, whether that's going to be useful, but at least it's a, an effort. And these are okay starts, but the US can do a lot more. Many countries have figured out how to give uh, people in their, in their countries uh, free tests to help them stay safe during this pandemic in a very equitable way. PCR is not more accurate. I wanna talk about some of the, the myths around um, and about these rapid tests because we are starting to see them become available and used. One of the greatest myths that's been around is that PCR is always more accurate than rapid tests. But for public health, rapid tests can tell you what you need to know and what you're actually asking, which is, am I infectious? You have a lot of viral load. If you look at somebody and their course of infection, people have a lot of viral load for a very short amount of time. And those are the people you want to identify as infectious. You do not want to identify people who are uh, beyond their state of being infectious, potentially weeks later, and ask them to not go to work. This, is, this creates a lot of problems when it comes down to isolation, and in particular for people who are already disenfranchised in numerous ways, asking people who are not infectious anymore to isolate and to quarantine their, their family and friends can be highly, highly damaging. We have to use the right tools. And unfortunately, we have been using tools that stay positive for a very long time in lieu of using the right tools, which are specific to what we care about, which is fast recognition of am I infectious and will I, am I at risk for spreading this virus? And they work identically well for symptomatic and asymptomatic people. There's been a lot of confusion. It's simply that when you're not symptomatic and you have had no symptoms during your course of infection, you can still have a lot of viral load but if you're not symptomatic, you don't know when you're taking the test in the course of your infection. So it looks like asymptomatic people are not being detected very well, but actually when you compare it to PCR, but it's just that you're detecting them usually too late after infectivity. So they work very well for both classes of individuals. Uh, this is just a different slide. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but the more viral load you have, the better the tests work. And this is really just showing that when you have very high viral load, this, this group of seven different tests have been evaluated in the UK and they show that they're nearly 100% sensitive compared to PCR to detect people who are the most at risk of infecting other people. So these simple, potentially equitable tools, these rapid tests can be used very reliably to stop transmission chains. And uh, the testing doesn't need to be 100% accurate uh, and it doesn't need to be 100% usage to have great impact in communities during this pandemic. For every infection that is stopped before they infect other people, you stop a whole tr chain of transmission events that would happen down the line, and you can stop outbreaks without having a test used by nearly everyone or that is 100% sensitive. Speed is incredibly important. If you're trying to create a program around how do I keep my school system safe? How do I keep my business safe, my workplace safe? You need a test that is fast. If you have a test that's slow, even if it's highly, highly sensitive, you're going to have people walking around while waiting for the result. And ultimately a 100% sensitive test 
that takes a couple of days to return is going to uh, not stop spread nearly as well as a lower sensitivity test that identifies everyone immediately. Time is more important for public health testing than sensitivity. And when we put it into person days, a 100% sensitive test that takes two days to return, if you have five infected people walk into a workplace and you get the result back two days later, that's 10 person days of walking around infectious and spreading it. If you have an 80% sensitive test on the bottom here, and you have rapid turnaround time of results, and those same five people walk into the workplace, you'll capture four of them immediately. They won't spread to their neighbors. And you'll ultimately have two person days walking around infectious with a less sensitive test, but because you have the results early, then they're not all walking around while waiting. So speed is of the essence for transmission. Um, put a different way, if we're infectious for six days, and a lab test takes two days to return, then for every three people that you identify with that two day turnaround time PCR test, you miss the equivalent of an entire infectious individual. So that means that even if you were to test 100% of people every single day, the maximum sensitivity that you could get in a population out of a two day turnaround test is only 67%. So you miss the equivalent of one person for every three. In reality, because a lot of testing has not been equitable and nor accessible, the real effective sensitivity to detect infectious people in the population has probably hovered more around 5% in the United States. We've, we've used testing to almost no real uh, effect thus far. Uh, and to be useful for medicine, we're starting to see uh, drugs come on board that are going to really change what it means to become infected and what the, what the role of this virus is in our society. If we have ways to treat the virus that are reliable, then we can, uh, then it really changes the balance and the equations that we have to consider in terms of what uh, other mitigation steps we take. But to get these, these treatments to people in a time frame where they will be beneficial, which is very early symptom onset, we need people to start on them very fast. The only way to do this is to make testing accessible and equitable. States should continue giving tests to individuals throughout the communities and provide them. They should give high-risk individuals uh, a lot of tests, like a, a group of tests that they just keep in their cupboard with the recommendation at the moment you feel symptoms, use a test. If you have a test that turns positive and you just had symptoms, you can then use that test to get a prescription and ideally get treatment started within hours or under 24 hours, rather than forcing people who are already having trouble just making their way to work, um, forcing them to, on the first sign of symptoms, go and stand in line for PCR test, wait days to return, only then to potentially start treatment a day after that, you'll miss the window where we can actually all benefit from these treatments. So the more accessible and equitably we can give these tests to people, the better that our population will fare. And finally, it's just a message that I've been harping on lately. Don't fall into a trap. When public health is effective, it, it goes unnoticed and unreported. Sorry for the typo. But because it's not perfect, inevitably, the only reports that will come out in the media are when a program fails. So even if it's only failing 1% of the time, almost 100% of the media reports will be about that 1% of the time. You don't ever see reports of the 99% when no event occurs. So just always keep in mind that issue when you're trying to dispel the myths uh, around different um, processes in this pandemic. Uh, I will stop there. I think I'm next. Just gonna, you can see that, right? Uh, Yes, yes, we can see it. Great, thanks. So um, I'm not a clinician and I'm not a doctor and an epidemiologist. I'm included on this panel because I'm from South Africa and hopefully I'm gonna try and bring you the lens of human rights and equity and why what happens in the US actually has an impact on us in Africa. So I want to talk to you about the problem of equity and access. And I think the issues of trust that some of the presenters have already spoken about. So unfortunately, we're in a situation of crisis, not just because of Omicron, uh, but 
before the variant was even discovered, we were looking at a situation of uh, gross inequity, what the WHO has called morally grotesque. We have a situation where Africa is largely not vaccinated. Uh, about 7% of people are fully vaccinated, and the definition of fully vaccinated has shifted in the last few weeks with the administration of third shots, uh, particularly in the global north. So of the 8 billion vaccine doses that have already been administered in the world, you can see where they've mostly gone to. Uh, less than 7% have actually gone to low-income countries, which explains why Africa is sitting with a very low vaccination rate. And this is because of, in my view, three particular reasons. Um, production, allocation, and distribution. And this new slide, which now indicates the administration of booster shots, you may have heard that in the UK, 500,000 booster shots were administered uh, within 24 hours, is that the context of the inequity also in the administration of booster shots is you know, influenced by production capacity and access to production, allocation, and then distribution. Uh, all of which, in our view, actually create a situation of artificial scarcity. So if this is a situation we're going to be heading into uh, for 2022, I think that uh, particularly for low-income countries in Africa, we have a serious crisis. And I think all of you better understand this than, than I do, that in this particular pandemic, every one of us is, is connected and everyone everywhere is not just a slogan. Uh, I think the, you know, the events of the last few weeks have actually... Uh, proven that uh, once again. So, you know, you may wonder why I'm showing you a map like this, which actually leads to the discussion about uh, the elephant in the room often when you're talking about equitable access to life-saving technologies and not just to vaccines, uh, but also testing and also potential treatments that may come onto the market in 2022. And I use the word market, uh, you know, uh, very cautiously in inverted commas. But the situation that we have is that for over a year, the world, particularly the countries which have the green ticks, and particularly uh, the countries which don't necessarily have high levels of vaccination in Africa, have actually been calling for a waiver, temporary suspension of intellectual property protections on all COVID-19 technologies, not just vaccines, so that we can access uh, testing kits, we can access ventilators in a more easier manner, we can repair uh, the necessary technologies and we can manufacture and produce that, that types of, uh, those types of technologies, not just vaccines, but also treatment and particularly diagnostics. And I just want to emphasize those two elements because, again, recent developments in respect of, of those particular uh, options doesn't really bode well for the supposed solidarity that was, was meant to be offered to, to the world. And the reason why I show you this map is because the US government could actually do a lot more. It now needs to pick up the pace. Its partial support of the vaccine waiver is not in, of the waiver only for vaccines is not enough, particularly because of what we've heard today in, in terms of access to testing as well as to potential treatment. Um, and significantly, the companies that are the you know, primary uh, vaccination uh, mainstay for countries like South Africa, which is Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, are actually headquartered in the US, uh, as well as Moderna. And obviously, the dispute between those companies and the US government in relation to the um, IP technology um, is, is, is significant. Um, and the Biden administration, I think, really could, could could, could do two things, could show more greater political leadership and could show bolder leadership. But I think you've got to get to a point at the end of 2021 where the issues around who owns the IP and the contestation around licensing and the ability of developing countries to manufacture not just vaccine, but the other technologies has to be resolved. We simply can't have another year of this prolonged conversation. Um, and, you you know, let me just give you an example as, as I get to the conclusion that there's currently a dispute between Moderna and the US government around uh, what we call the NIH Moderna vaccine. Now, that is important, even though South Africa is not using the Moderna vaccine, because Moderna refused to sell to us or has not sold to us, and in fact, hasn't delivered to any low-income country since the beginning of this pandemic. It shows its, its customers based on their income classification, is that we have the first WHO mRNA hub in South Africa. And the companies are bypassing it, like Pfizer and Moderna. 
the 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 issue with Pfizer is that most of us, for example, uh, in Southern Africa, have had to use the Pfizer vaccine because Johnson and Johnson was unable to deliver for the better part of the year, and that's got to do with the Baltimore plant and, and a number of other factors. But the bottom line is that Pfizer is now talking about a third dose, is now talking about a fourth dose. These are not yet authorized uh, necessarily for full scale up in, in South Africa, but it does mean that we're going to need more supplies. So the red map that I showed you about the, the, the pace at which booster shots are being administered in the global north is a concern for us because it does mean that one, we need to have access to potential third shots, but particularly countries in Africa that haven't even uh, vaccinated their healthcare workers still need to get access to the first shot. And the US government is the, is the, is the, is the kingmaker here. The Biden administration can really take you know, necessary measures against Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, as well as other uh, test companies and, and uh, Pfizer and, and Merck in relation to the treatment options uh, in this particular context. And then lastly, you know, um, the, the resolution of the waiver has to be done on an urgent basis. And the US, again, could play a very significant role in it. And so we'd really urge you to speak to your, to your US lawmakers and to the Biden administration. It's simply unacceptable to be in the middle of a global pandemic where we're all having to rely on what the Biden administration does or what the EU does in relation to these companies and in relation to the TRIPS waiver. Uh, so that that really has to be urgently resolved. We can't continue having these like long, you know, conversations at, at a diplomatic level about how trade rules are going to prevent meaningful access, given the situation that we're dealing with of inequity of, of potentially increasing infections, especially with Omicron. Um, my final point is that it's really interesting, and, and thank you to all the pre presenters to hear about three things: misinformation in the U.S. Uh, obviously, the definition of what's a fully vaccinated person is, is, is different for the U.S. and it's different for us in Africa, where, like I said earlier, many of us haven't uh, even received the first shot in Africa. But there's clearly an issue around hesitancy, uh, which is linked to disinformation and also an anti-vax uh, movement. Now, we were told by the CEOs of pharmaceutical companies that that is only happening in Africa. So I think it's really fascinating your research. Uh, which basically illustrates and shows that hesitancy and misinformation is, is an issue that is bedeviling all of our vaccine programs and the really racist kind of assumption that this is only an issue for Africa and that is why we are not worthy or deserving of timely supplies or sufficient supplies uh, is, is something that we, we need you to help us to convey to the Biden administration as well as to the CEOs of pharmaceutical companies that are headquartered in the US. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshita Sadula, and I'm the organizing director for Right to Health Action, uh, a grassroots advocacy organization that focuses on pandemic prevention policies. I, I don't have any slides today, but I wanted to thank uh, Fatima for so clearly laying out the scene for why global vaccination is so immediately needed um, and for calling out the U.S. government for not doing enough. We can all do something about that, which is what I would like to talk about today. Um, sadly, COVID is just one of the many zoonotic diseases that we've had to contend with in our lifetimes. And as a result of globalization and climate change, there are uh, only going to be more zoonotic spillovers of disease. Um, and it's not gonna be long before we're facing down another pandemic, uh, COVID the sequel. And it's really heartbreaking to see that, you know, almost two years after the start of this pandemic, policy discussions about pandemic preparedness are still focusing exclusively on containment. Um, which is important. We want to be detecting outbreaks sooner and responding faster so we can stop the spread. Uh, but this focus on just containment is, is inherently racist as it fails to acknowledge the role of prevention and the responsibility we have to ensure people everywhere are protected from disease outbreaks. Just containing the spread of disease works to protect those of us who are privileged enough to live far away from the brooding grounds for zoonotic spillover. But true prevention would mean stopping outbreaks from happening in the first place and protecting those who live on the front lines of tropical forest communities where deforestation and climate change are contributing to zoonotic disease. So preparedness without prevention has already proven to be an incredibly expensive and deadly failure. And we can't continue to keep making this mistake. 
policymakers must be planning for and anticipating the next pandemic. And it's up to us as public health professionals to direct their attention and focus their energies on tackling these environmental drivers of zoonotic spillover. So the challenge before us today isn't a scientific problem. Uh, research has already told us what needs to be done. We already know who has the power to make it happen. What we have here in front of us is a problem of politics and power. We're in a, a unique moment of time where there's a call for real change and action. And it calls for us to, to do more and to be more. We can't just be public health professionals and political advocates. We must also be community organizers. We have to move past beyond just raising awareness and engaging folks in discourse. We should be working to mobilizing our communities to take real action. You know, events like this one are great for starting the conversation, but we can't stop here. We can't just be looking uh, at the micro or individual level. We need to zoom out and take a look at the bigger picture. We need to look at the global context and look upstream at what's right around the corner, which is another pandemic. And we can't afford to lose focus on this bigger picture. Um, there are so many of us here today with our scientific expertise, um, which we should be lending the weight and knowledge of that to be building campaigns, to organize constituencies, to put pressure on their policymakers. Um, as we all know, real change lies in policy change. Um, and it's time that we as public health professionals took on that organizer role to build power, um, to influence these decision makers, to influence these policymakers who will the, the, you know, construct the policy that we so need. Um, and in order to do that, we need to get their attention. We need to get their attention and make these demands. We need to name the names of the people that hold the power to do more, to do better, um, the policymakers that have the power to enact better policies. And we need to hold them accountable to their jobs uh, and to their promises. The Biden administration has been uh, quite vocal. You know, They've spoken out time and time again about the investments that need to be made for ending this pandemic and preventing the next one. But very little has been done to actually follow through on these promises. Um, at Right to Health Action, we're working to ensure that our representatives are hearing directly from us about what needs to be done. We connect members of our communities that have been the hardest hit to their members of Congress to make their priorities known. Um, and we need to continue to be doing that work now. This is the time to act. We have a, a unique opportunity in front of us, a legislative vehicle that will provide an opportunity to, to alter these, these fundamental drivers of zoonotic transmission. We have a chance to not only vaccinate the world, but also stop the pandemics of the future. Um, so uh, the call to action here for us in terms of next steps is focusing on the upcoming supplemental appropriation spending bill uh, that's working its way up in Congress. This uh, bill provides the perfect opportunity to carry through on uh, the promises made by the Biden administration. Uh, President Biden has promised to help vaccinate 70% of the world by uh, September of 2022. Uh, and this bill is the best way to ensure we take the right, the first step towards that. Uh, we can also use the spending bill to ensure that there are funds set aside to invest in global pandemic prevention, something that was pledged by Vice President Kamala Harris at the White House COVID summit earlier this year. This uh, supplemental spending bill is the perfect opportunity to carry through on these promises, and we need to be organizing our communities to ensure that this bill includes these two essential policies. We need our supporters to be showing up in person and making noise and demanding more of our representatives and making sure that our voices are heard, that we're not getting ignored. Uh, webinars and discussion groups won't win us the change that we need. We need direct action and we need active lobbying. And I'm hoping that today's conversation is just the start of this movement for change. So thank you all. Hi everyone, um, I'm Greg Gonzalez. I'm an Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. Um, I just wanna follow on, uh, on my colleague from Right to Health Action about the next steps. Um, a couple of things. I think we need to go from top to bottom and think about this um, from our families and our friends and the people we, we care about and how do we take care of each other. We've been incredibly generous with um, our, our neighbors over the past two years in keeping people safe early on in the, in the pandemic all the way through now where we put on masks voluntarily, we, we, we check in on our neighbors to see if they need things. Um, but I think we really need to think as we go into this winter, how we can protect the most vulnerable among us. I work on substance use in my day job. 
Um, and we've seen an, an explosion of overdoses around uh, the country. And so as we think about taking care of ourselves and, and hunkering down to deal with this next wave of, of the pandemic, um, we need to think about what's going on in our communities and thinking as we um, leave our houses about the concentric circles that emanate from there. Um, so we can help each other in lots of ways and mutual aid schemes have popped up and we've done lots of stuff to, to protect ourselves and our families. But we can't do it alone. You need to engage. And you know, we just talked about what Congress can do and what the Biden White House can do, but really we need to engage the level of school boards and city councils and mayors, because that's where the rubber hits the road in public health, as we've heard from our um, previous speakers in, in this webinar. Um, local health departments in, in, as well. Remember, um, as, as well as being local and state driven, public health is in crisis at a local level. We've had 50,000 uh, workers lost at the state and local level for public health since the 2008 recession. So we're going into the pandemic um, with lack of capacity um, at, at the fundamental place where public health is uh, enacted in, in the United States. And so figure out how you can be a force for change at your school boards, at your city councils and your mayor's offices, how you can support your, your local health departments and the work they do. Often they're, they're juggling multiple tasks, whether it's testing or vaccine administration, um, and don't have the resources to do it all. How can you volunteer? How can you be an advocate right in your own hometown? Um, then at the level of mayors, um, and the level of governors and states, you know, we'd like to think about um, policies being enacted by governors, being dictated by whether you're in a red state or a blue state. Um, but I know I live in a, in a blue state of Connecticut and our, our governor, Governor Lamont, was just at a big thousand person gathering at a casino in the state talking to the restaurant owners and saying, we're not gonna have any more shutdowns. We're not gonna have any mask mandates in this state. Um, just as Omicron was coming across the, the transom and, and the news we were getting and, and bragged about how um, you know the path is only forward. And there's, there's a temptation by politicians, both in red and blue states, to see the path of least resistance. To take the fact that we're all tired and fed up from this pandemic and all we've done to, to move away from the, the, the um, recommendations you've heard from, from our speakers over the past hour and a half. Um, and then one last bit before I leave you and I pass it on to the final speaker is that President Biden had a plan in 2020 at the beginning of, this, at the beginning of his term in 2021 to comprehensively address the pandemic. Um, and it's become this boosters overall strategy. We haven't heard uh, really enough about masking or, or rapid tests or ventilation or any of the sort of very specific recommendations we've heard from our speakers today. Um, the policies are being very closely held in the White House. Um, Ron Klain, Jeffrey Zients and others are making decisions, um, really excluding most of the public health and science community from these debates. Um, it's really a, a West Wing pandemic preparedness response that's happening right now before our very eyes. And there's no political cost to him for maintaining the status quo, whether it's on vaccine access around the world or making rapid tests available to all Americans to making sure that we have masks to use on a daily basis that are that are, that are worthwhile to be used um, and will protect us from, from transmission. So you need to step up, right, in your, your, your hometown, in your states, and at the federal level. And you need to challenge misinformation, right? As we're sitting here, we're getting spammed by anti-vaxxers on the YouTube channel. Um, but in your own lives, you hear misinformation, you need to step up and you need to challenge it. You need to resist political profiteering, whether it's Ned Lamont here in Connecticut or Ron DeSantis in Florida. You need to speak up and challenge politicians who use the pandemic to, to, for political gain rather than promoting the public health. And then we need to confront corporate greed. As my friend Fatima Hassan said from South Africa, um, life and death decisions have been made by a few men at a few companies around the world about who gets vaccines over the next uh, next two years. Um, Albert Boyler from Pfizer, Stefan Barcel from Moderna. And they, they, can, they can sort of ride this out, collecting their billions of dollars as, as we watch people suffer and die across the globe. So you need to confront corporate greed and speak out. So, you know, I've been an AIDS activist all my life and a public health and a global health activist for all my life, but I'm making an appeal to you that we all need to do this together right now. We've never seen such a, a global calamity in our lifetimes. Um, and we're not going to get out of this in, unless we're all in it together. Thanks. So thank you, all of the uh, outstanding speakers. Um, for those of you who haven't heard the news, there is an outbreak of about 900 cases at Cornell University. 
There are, is another outbreak at Princeton, not quite as large, but substantial. There is an increasing number of cases at Hopkins, I'm being told, rapidly. Um, and, and this points to a, um, uh, an immediate crisis that we are headed into with the Omicron variant on top of the Delta uh, 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 outbreak that we've been facing uh, until now. And there really is need for a policy reset. And what we've heard today is that in order to achieve that reset, we have to engage across all levels of the system from the community level with uh, engaging with uh, the local needs, the local leaders um, of, of people who uh, need to be able to trust uh, and to engage ultimately in their own safety uh, because most of the action is actually action by the community and not by uh, medical or public health individuals. So um, everyone has to help in order to make it work. Um, for, and all the way up to the global level of decisions about policy, of international policy. Um, and for that reason, uh, we have established the World Health Network uh, to be a, um, to help create visibility and uh, cooperation, coordination among many teams that have been established and formed around the world um, to bring forward the need for action, the opportunity to be able to control the pandemic, not by waiting for it to slam us as we've been doing until now, uh, but by anticipating what's going to happen. Uh, if today with the Omicron uh, variant, we wait until hospitals are full at the rate that it grows, which is doubling at about two, maybe a little bit more, uh, a factor of two every two to three days. Um, if we stop every case from transmitting at the time when the hospitals are overflowing, it will still grow to a factor of a hundred more about before um, uh, uh, the, the cases will stop because of the infections that are already happened surely leading to dramatic overflow of hospitals and inability to provide care. So we have a huge challenge in front of us to change reactive thinking to proactive action that can involve all of the measures uh, from ventilation and masking to mass testing. Uh, and even, unfortunately, if we need to do it and, and, and if we may need to do it to doing lockdowns it will stop this from continuing to affect us. And if people are unhappy about the economic conditions over the last two years, we are only perpetuating it by ignoring the disease and, and living with this virus when we could take action uh, to really control it and ultimately to eliminate it. So thank you very much, Julia, for organizing this uh, a program uh, of policy reset at a very greatly needed uh, reset. So please, I'll hand it back to Julia, who will uh, uh, engage in the question and answer. And if anybody would like uh, to learn more about the World Health Network, please look us up, we're available. Um, our objective is to enable people to take action. That's the way we're going to be able to overcome this outbreak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers today. It has been um, such a pleasure to come together with all of you um, I, and really show that, that we do care, that we do see that we can do better, and we, we will work to coordinate our efforts to be most effective in doing better. And so in that spirit, please do join some of these, these networks. Um, uh, we have a sign-up form at tinyurl.com slash um, we care COVID. Uh, and you can sign up there to help um, do things as simple as communicating the facts to your community, uh, whether that's through something like Twitter or through TikTok. We can join together to let people know what's happening and how to protect themselves, and, and we can make a difference in our community. We have several fantastic questions today so uh, from uh, several people who submitted them in our online form, so I will go ahead and start asking those. I'm going to start um, with Michael Mina, uh, since he has to head out. So uh, the first question for him is, how do we formalize rapid testing into policies with a focus on equity? How do we make them equitable policies? Well, I think the first step is we need to have the CDC 
actually recognize that these are tools for public health. We also need the FDA to do that. A lot of people focus, a lot of states and counties, uh, people all look uphill, if you will. So counties look to their states, states look to the federal government, and the federal government has largely entirely failed in this regard. I think the first thing we need to do and the most effective would be to have leadership at the WHO and the CDC start de developing that policy and programs. These tests aren't that effective if they're just completely scattered about. We saw that in early 2020 when the Trump administration essentially just sort of scattered rapid tests throughout the country. It was a good first attempt, but it, it should have driven home that you also need to have policy and strategy. And part of that strategy has to be focused on ensuring that these tests are reaching the people who will benefit most from them. And in many ways, those are gonna be people who don't already have access to a lot of other tools. They're going to be people who can't take off work to go and, and quarantine, to get a PCR test and then quarantine while waiting for a result. Um, we have to have leadership develop the programs. And you know, I've personally offered my service many times to the White House and the CDC, and I've been you know, asked on various occasions to help. But in general, I think we also, it starts with just recognizing that they're tools. And for some reason, just, just a few minutes ago, the WHO posted out saying that vaccines alone won't stop Omicron and, and then listed off a whole array of public health tools, but didn't list testing. You know, and testing is our eyes on the virus. It's the only way we know where the virus is, that it continues to be swept under the rug as a public health tool just because tests are usually medical devices is just, it's one of the most mind boggling things. So I think the more we just press on the government to recognize it and it's getting there, certainly it's starting. And then we have to formalize the strategic plans. We have to actually give people roadmaps and, and, and sort of workbooks to say, if this is your scenario, this is what you can do because otherwise people are very, very confused. There's more information about tests than almost anything else here. And, you know, at least in the public health world. And um, so that's the biggest thing. And I think we need to have federal money to just pay for them. Nobody should be profiting off of, you know, giving people access to the tools that they are, you know, that is going to allow them to keep their neighbors safe. You know, and, I, and unfortunately in the US, and I just took a job at a company that's working on this, but the US, the, the government didn't take it over. And so it's enabled companies to spring up around it, which I just, I mean, I've been calling for two years for these to just be produced by the government and free and messaged by the government. I, I hope that there's still hope that they will do that, frankly, even if it means putting myself out of business. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think a couple of points come out to me, I think, um, you know, one thing is that we, we recognize that we have learned a lot about how, what to do about COVID and, and about all of our tools uh, that are most effective, really vaccines, um, masks, rapid tests, and ventilation. All of these tools are, are, are effective. None of them are perfect and that's okay. And all of them together are best used with a, a concrete strategy that reaches those who need them most. Um, and I, I appreciated that during his campaign, President Biden put out a four point plan for to support essential workers that included free rapid tests and free N95 masks. Um, both produced through the Defense Production Act. And I think that is the kind of thing that would be really helpful to do now. I'm happy to see some states starting to do that, but, um, but I, I don't think the states have the same resources as the federal government. I really appreciate your encouraging that and, and that we're all coming here to encourage better on that front. So thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll, we'll let you uh, head out, but uh, really appreciate your perspective. Sure. I'll, I'll add one thing just on the mask yeah. issue. Um, imagine a world where you have people have N95s and you have them have rapid tests. You know, it's, it's obvious nobody wants to wear an N95 all, all day long, all the time throughout their life. But if you have family members who are found to be positive and you, you literally can't isolate because you live in a, a home that doesn't have 18 rooms in it, if people were able to, to use their N95s and still be able to coexist, because we know that N95s work really well to stop transmission uh, outward and inward. And so put an N95 on the people when they're infected and they know it and put an N95 on vulnerable people who might be in the room. 
that alone would be, you know, that we can use these tools synergistically. And, you know, we, I, I think that that should be part of any plan moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we see that vaccines are both very important and not enough on their own. And like, similarly, like we, we never want to pit our tools against each other. We always want to use the most effectively together. So um, I, I think that's exactly the right spirit. Thank you. Um, and I, I also appreciate having worked with um, Project N95 that they're doing so much work around um, masks that are more comfortable. Um, and um, and I had the opportunity to try. There was a, a large donation from Gerson masks, and um, and they they're a lot roomier, but they were it was a very comfortable mask. It is uh, my favorite mask to wear around now. So, um, I they they made a large donation to our Fall River Hard Hit um, community here in Massachusetts. Um, and maybe uh, maybe it actually makes sense while you're still here to turn it over. Um, my next question is is a little bit broader for our. Um, our community organizations and local health departments. But I wonder what your perspective is on rapid tests, um, uh, Dr. Chapel, Dr. Sumo. Um, and it looks like maybe we lost uh, Christina Alonso. So maybe um, we'll just start there with uh, with Dr. Chapel and Alonso. Or sorry, sorry, chapel and a <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, great. No, then no, thank you for um, bringing together such an esteemed group of people. So did you want me to just address like rapid testing or like, is that? Yeah, so while we have Michael here, maybe it's helpful to address rapid testing. And then after that, I, I have a broader question about um, how about broader investments that state and federal governments can make to, um, to support um, equitable vaccine delivery. Uh, and, you know, th thinking about like, a lot of investments that have happened in consulting companies and Isaac Stanley Becker from the Washington Post documented that really well. What are some other things that we should be investing in to improve equitable vaccine delivery? That's the second part of the question. But while Michael's here, I wonder, you know, how do we, how can health centers uh, um, and local health departments work together on rapid testing? And what do you see from where you are about how people would use rapid tests? Yeah, no, I think access has been an issue. We know that when we compare to places such as the UK, where you can just receive a whole supply in the mail for a whole week, we're sort of living in a very different place. So a couple of things that I've seen that are sort of an improvement. Number one, the city of Boston um, um, uh, sort of reporting last week that they were going, they were, they actually had rapid tests that they were going to um, actually provide to some of the uh, the places that have been the hardest hit from COVID, actually making it accessible and free to those communities, I think is a, is a long is actually like a first good step um, because of the costs that are associated. So I think that's really nice to see. And then the second thing is this week the governor um, also declaring a similar approach of having a, providing access to rapid tests. So I think that now that um, those tests are hopefully going to be. Uh, accessible. It's going to be key to disseminate them really quickly. And also pairing it, you know, now that we're going to have the antivirals that are hopefully going to come on the scene with that extra tool in our toolbox, it is going to be really important to be able to, how can we pair up those two, those, those different tools that we have so that, you know, if you identify someone, how do you rapidly provide them access to, to let's say antivirals and, and sort of um, stem the tide of the spread of infection. So I, I think that, um, access is being worked on. So I like this progress, but sort of trying to pair it with other um, other measures that we have are, are going to be key. Thank you. Michael, any comments before you head out on, on those, those partnerships? No, I think, I mean, I, I really think that uh, the more that they can occur, um, you know, and we really at some point have to ensure that the partnerships are really getting down to on the ground work and ensuring that people who are actually going to be helping people to use these, helping people to get treatments based on the, these tests are, you know, are completely engaged in the process. And um, uh, I'm just fully in favor of any, uh, any additional, you know, any time that these types of connections are made and we have seen, you know, starts um, at various times. I do think that actually we're seeing momentum gain for it now. Um, but, you know, I don't want to say too little too late because it's not, uh, but certainly delayed. <laughs> so. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and um, maybe I'll turn it back over to you then, um, Dr. Sumo, just um, to talk about um, uh, how can federal and state governments invest in the good work that um, community health centers are doing and, and invest in community health centers, being able to expand access to everything, right? Um, delivery of vaccines, but also are, are health centers a good place to distribute um, uh, free N95 masks and free rapid tests to the communities that need them most? Yeah, no, definitely. You know, the, the community health centers are, as I mentioned before earlier in my talk, are like trusted, you know, sources. You know, people go there for their other primary care. They've developed a relationship with the clinician. And so when I when we come to them and we say, you know, this vaccine is safe and effective or this mask actually work and it will protect you and your family, um, you know, it's easier to convey that message and to make, you know, patients trust us. So I think that using the community health centers um, as sort of a, a um, centralized place to disseminate all the different tools that we have is going to be important. But one thing that we're facing, and even, you know, me as an infectious disease physician who's at a safety net hospital is once we've had access, right, it was really great to see the federal government kind of work directly with the health centers and send vaccines. And it was really nice to see what B at BMC we were able to do. Is so we're really going to have to tackle misinformation because the vaccines are available. Like for instance, now for the you know the five to ten year olds, um, the vaccines are available. They work, but we're seeing such disparities. Right? You compare a place such as Arlington, where the face week, first week, seventy seven percent of five to ten year olds had received their vaccines, to like other places where it was you know far much lower. So. So I think that it's going to take a lot of effort and there should be investment. And how do we um, have these go to the community, have conversations? And we don't necessarily want those conversations to happen in a clinical setting at the health center, which is important. But, you know, it's hard to, to one thing we've learned is you have to go where people are. You have to go to the community. You can't expect the community and people to come to you. And so organizing, you know, community comes and we've done this at BMC, we've had multilingual conversations from like, you know, Cape Verdean Creole to, you know, and Spanish and Haitian, um, and usually also bringing like the stakeholders such as the faith leaders, um, having these conversations and answer the questions. I mean, for me, one thing that's pretty striking, but now that we have the vaccines for like the five to 10 year olds that are available, is that parents who were themselves willing to get vaccinated, are have a lot of questions about vaccinating their children under five to ten years. You know, they want to know what are the long term consequences of of vaccines. And and what I always tell them is, you know, you know, from what we know in the history of vaccine, and I'm actually going to spread that gospel right here since it's an opportunity to get that word out. I'm going to wear my infectious disease hat. But you know, when you look at the history of vaccines and all the vaccines that we have, if you were to have any side effects, they're often short term. And any side effects that we've seen, we usually see within eight weeks. And at this point, we have a lot of children who've been vaccinated. We have 5 million children actually who've been vaccinated since we approved the vaccines for the five to 10 year olds. We don't have any safety signals um, and we don't expect any long-term consequences. That's where parents are most concerned about, you know, I'm older, I can get vaccinated, but I'm worried about my child. And we know now that with all the variants that are coming up, going to need to vaccinate a higher proportion of, of people to actually get all of us to like the new a new sense of normalcy. That is why it is so key and important to answer those questions so that parents feel comfortable, so that the uh, feel comfortable vaccinating their children, so that individuals who have been eligible for a very long time, uh, you know, get vaccinated now so that they have time off, you know, if their concerns are like side effects. So anyway, I think that now it's the time where we really need to tackle the misinformation and continue to answer all those questions within the community. Yeah, and this this is uh, where it's also so important to make sure we get out factual information in several languages um, to everybody in all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, and I think many people may not realize like how likely it is that, that children will get COVID right now wh where they are that the school age children are getting the most COVID and there's a far higher risk of myocarditis from getting COVID than there is from getting the vaccine. Um, and there's also a very high risk to family members uh, that comes with children getting COVID. And a lot of times when people get sick, they, um, you know, even just missing work um, with a, an infection is not too severe can mean people don't have enough food to eat if they're not getting their paycheck 
can mean um, really high bills if they're hospitalized and, and of course can mean the worst for 170,000 kids right now. So, um, so really controlling COVID in schools is very important and, um, and helping to vaccinate kids and reduce the spread um, and reduce the effects on the children themselves is important. Um, children may be exposed to repeated infection while they stay in crowded indoor settings and um, we wanna make sure that they're as protected as possible. So yes, thank you for that. I, I think that those are uh, really excellent points. I think also, um, I'm sorry not to have Aaron uh, uh, Sojourner with us anymore, but I'm really grateful to him for joining us as an economist, because I think um, so many of the policies that we're talking about today um, really um, uh, acknowledge and um, emphasize the economic impacts of the public health policies. We know that it is a joint crisis of public health and the economy. Uh, we also know that that both crises are hitting low income all the hardest, uh, and so uh, that is partly why we um, we suggest that we use policies like vaccine mandates or um, or mask policies that uh, and and um, free rapid tests and free N95s because they are actually the opposite of lockdowns. They make things better for everyone. They also make things better for people who are high income. Um, you know, right now um, we're, we're in this circumstance where there's very high transmission for everyone. We're going to a holiday party it is taking your own health in, into a more risky situation. It's also affecting your community. And, you know, we want everyone to be able to go out and enjoy your lives and, and live your best. Um, and the way that we do that is, is to protect each other, to know that if we go somewhere that we're not, um, you know, we're not taking someone's family member from them because, because of an infection that happens at an event or that happens um, through onward transmission afterwards. So, um, you know, I, I think the point that we're making today is, is that the public health and the economy go hand in hand. We need more collaboration, um, more collaboration not between um, between people in public health and people who are in, in uh, economists, but also more collaboration with people who are doing the frontline work, um, people um, who are, are working in health centers, um, people who are working in community organizations, serving the communities hit hardest, um, people who are essential workers and leaders of, um, of unions um, and managers of stores who are, who are essential workers, because I think um, in academia, we are privileged to um, work in institutions that look pretty different and to live in neighborhoods that look pretty different than the neighborhoods that are most affected. Um, and so I, I think we always have to keep that in mind. And, and that's the kind of leadership that we need going forward. Um, so in, in that spirit, I'm, I'm just so glad to have had this fantastic panel today. Um, I, th I think we'll end questions there, but I really appreciate that there were several questions about how we can come together to, to help, how we can get policymakers to do more. And I think keep speaking up, keep, keep writing op-eds, keep sharing factual information, um, keep sharing it in, in, in academic circles, but also keep sharing it um, with, with your social media, um, get your kids to share it <laughs> with their social media. Um, they make much cooler videos than anything I can make. <laughs> um, uh, so, so keep getting the word out about the facts, about the inequities, about how we can explicitly counter them and, and keep coming together like everyone here has today. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's been such a privilege to work with you on, on this. And, uh, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Should we stop the live stream, please?